Thanks for tuning back in to Unsolved No More with me, Detective Ken Maines. Now, today what I want to talk about a little bit, not too in-depth, uh, it's just because I've gotten a lot of questions about it, is the Natalie Holloway case. Now, I've known about this case for a, a very long time, just like everybody else. I followed it, um, but not too intently, but probably a little bit more than I did most. Um... And now that it's, you know, there's a confession and it's quote unquote solved, what I like to do is take stock in it. Meaning, I like to look back and say, okay, what can we learn from it? I do that with every single solved case. Like, if I'm flipping through my phone looking at news, uh, which I do occasionally, um, and apparently, you know, AI has it figured out that when you click on a certain thing, more of those things get into your news feed. So my news feed is basically uh, Pittsburgh Steeler football, old time boxing, and true crime for some reason. So I, every time I see a headline that says cold case solved, I always, always click into it. Now, sometimes on my news feed, there'll be like uh, Nicole Boley or like some, some true crime thing that's happening and that's unsolved right now. It's a big mass hysteria or whatever it is. In the true crime community, I very rarely click into those. Um, but when I see it solved, I clicked into it because I want to know what we can learn from it. So... With Natalie Holloway, this is what I take from that. Number one, it's usually what it seems. Okay? When I look back at it, and at the time when I was looking at it, you know, she left the club with three guys. They were the last to see her. Now, that doesn't automatically mean anything, really, other than it gives you a place to start. Like, that's, you know... That's a good place to start your questioning in your investigation. But it doesn't mean nothing. Because they could drop her off at her house. Let's say, I know in this case that doesn't apply. But they could be dropped off at the house and there could be an intruder waiting inside. You know, when she gets home or something like that. Now, you have to start deducing some things. You know, she didn't have a house. She was at a hotel. She was with a bunch of friends or whatever it was. Uh, you can rule, start ruling some of that stuff out. But, listen, I mean, I, I think I am very confident in saying that through following it the way that I did, I knew that Jordan Vandersloop had murdered her. But, so what? So did a lot of other people. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. But, I mean, it certainly was solidified, you know, right? You have this inkling, you have this feeling, the way things are, but there's still doubt. That doubt was all removed from me, anyhow. I know it hasn't from a lot of people, but when a second girl turned up murdered that he was in a hotel with, um, th then all that did at that point in time was reaffirm that I was right in the beginning. So when I started to waver, well, maybe it isn't. Uh, it's just like test taking, right? Usually it's the first answer that pops into your mind, but then you start overthinking it. Well, it could be this one. And then you change your mind. Then you find out that it was your first initial instinct anyhow, and you should have went with it. That's how a lot of these true crime cases are. So when he murdered the, the second person, the girl, you know, I, 
then I knew 100%. But, again, I'm never happy because I always want a confession. Now, you always want a confession as a detective, you know. But as a human, as somebody that, you know, Joe Kenda once told me, and I always stick with this. It always comes to me, you know. To, to be a good detective, all you need is a natural curiosity. And I just love that so much. And I always bring that up because it's so true. Okay, I now know that Natalie Holloway was killed by Jordan Vandersuit. Okay, I knew that a long time ago. But I need to know more. I'm not good with, I can't close that chapter and move on. Because I need to know why, I need to know how. Sometimes the how is more important to me than why. And I think that's because I can figure out why. You know, that's not very hard to figure out in most unsolved murder cases. It's the how. Because I th the how allows me to critique myself in my earlier thoughts and investigation saying, well, I think that it happened like this because of, you know, X, Y, Z. How it happens just allows you to become a better investigator because you can match it up to how you thought it happened to begin with because of the evidence or what it tells you. So, here we have Jordan Vandersloot, who, by the way, is not the sharpest tool in the shed. You know, he tries to extort money from Natalie's mom. What's her, her name's Beth. Now, I know, I don't know Beth, but I know I'm like a link away from her because the show I was doing at the time... I believe it was Hunt for the Zodiac Killer. Yes, it was. And I was talking to the director because she got her own show at some point in time. But, you know, I, I never want to talk bad about victims or victims' families or anything. I just know I remember them saying she was very difficult. For what that's worth. I mean, who, you know, people say I'm difficult. So it is what it is. Uh, but that was told to me, and I always remembered it. Now, you know, if my child was murdered, I'd probably be difficult too. So I, I don't know what he meant by that, and I didn't ask more because none of my business, right? I stay in my lane. Uh, but he tried, Jordan Vandersloot tried to extort her. Now, what does that mean? You know, he sets up this thing that, Hey, I will show you where Natalie's remains are if you send me X amount of money. And he arranged this through her lawyer. Her lawyer went to, I guess it was Aruba. I'm not sure the, where. And caught him in this thing because they were smart enough to go to law enforcement. And anyhow, that ended up bringing his world down. <sighs> not the other girl that he killed that's a whole other story but he gets arrested he but still you know he likes he's one of these offenders that likes to play games and likes to taunt and you know they they feel that they have this power because they know something that everybody else wants to know so Give out a little snippet here, a little snippet there, just to tease them a little, much like the Zodiac Killer. You know, narcissists get off like that, okay? So, throughout the years, he's given little things, and there's been theories of what happened to her. So, finally, he comes out he, in this plea agreement. He has to say what happened. And this is the account that he gives. After the three boys, I want to say, leave with Natalie from the club, which is mistake number one. Women, girls, even men. Just 
don't leave the club. Girls, don't leave the club with three guys. Don't leave with one that you don't know. Okay? Just don't do it. Nothing good can happen from it. You think there is, but just don't do it. That's my after school thought for the day. She leaves. The two brothers drop Jordan and her off at the beach. And they lay down in the sand and start making out. He says he starts to progress by feeling her up. She stops him. This makes him mad. He says she knees him in the crotch. Now, let's stop right. Well, let me, I'll, I'll go through what, what else he says, and then I'll go back to this. She knees him in the crotch. This infuriates him. He stands up and kicks her in the head. He's not sure that she's dead or unconscious. He thinks she's just unconscious. He finds a cinder block, which is nearby, and he comes back and he smashes her head with it. He then drags her into the ocean, and then he goes home and watches porn. Now, let's go back to his statement. Now, this is a known liar. Okay? And let me tell you what criminals who engage in some sort of sexual activity fetish that is frowned upon do they do what you call minimize their involvement i've seen it a million times okay you, you talk to a, uh, somebody that you arrest for child pornography and they'll say well yeah i did download it two times um three times maybe and then you get on their computer and there's fifteen thousand. they they're admitting to it but they're, they're minimizing it um, something that you may be more familiar with, a DUI stop. Nine times out of ten, when you pull somebody over for a DUI and they're drinking and you go up and you ask them how much did they have to drink tonight, they'll say two drinks, two beers, all the time. Almost all the time. When in fact, they had ten. So, it's minimizing. Now, that's not obviously in a sexual context but it's still a criminal minimizing their involvement when he says she need him in the crotch for refusing his advances she trying to stop he leaves out a little bit of a section there okay i'm here to tell you this right now he leaves a part out where he says i'm trying to rape her but he left that part out why? Because he's minimizing it. He don't want people to know that. He don't care that people know that he killed her or when he tried to extort money. You know, I mean, that's just a big shot criminal. But when you start getting into that rape word, they don't like that in prison much. Okay? And they don't like it to look bad upon them. I don't have to rape anybody. I can get women anytime I want. All right, jerk off. Listen, he's minimizing, without a doubt, that he tried to sexually assault Natalie on that beach. I agree that she did knee him in the, in the groin. Um, and that, yes, did make him mad. Yes, did cause him to probably stand up and punt her in the head. Um, and then his anger isn't, isn't fulfilled. The rage isn't gone yet. So he grabs a cinder block and smashes. Now, I've never been to where they were, where it was Aruba uh, on a beach. I don't know anything about it. I've never seen a cinder block on a beach. Maybe I did, and I just don't remember. But I remember reading that and felt that, that feels kind of odd, but I have no reason to doubt it because the, the manner of death, how he killed her, doesn't really matter in the context of that he, she's dead, right? If he strangles her. Which makes more sense to me, but does that change anything in his mind? Like, I can't tell the truth. I can't say that I strangled her because that makes me look weak or it makes me whatever. No. 
So I, I tend to believe him that he smashed her head with a cinder block. It reminds me, now people ask me when they emailed me, ask me uh, why, you know, why did he do this? Um, is it a sexually motivated crime? It's yes and no. I have a oh, perfect example. If you go back and I, maybe I'll try to link this at the end of this, my Jennifer Hill series where Kim Hubbard was arrested for killing a 12 year old Jennifer Hill and he had strangled her to death and her pants and underwear were pulled down to her ankles and her, her one breast was exposed. That was not a sexually motivated crime, meaning it wasn't a fantasy. It wasn't, it, it could have been a fantasy, but it wasn't why she was killed. You know, it wasn't like I'm going to sexually assault her and strangle her. That's my intent. No, in that case, it was a sexually motivated crime, meaning he wanted sex from that young girl. And she said no, or something to that effect. I'm going to tell whatever it is. And that infuriated him, that rage. And then he strikes out and kills. That's what happened here with Natalie Holloway. His intent wasn't to rape. It was surely sexually motivated. And when she turned him down and fought back, he snapped. Rage. And he kills her with the cinder block. So, police officers and investigators have to be careful when they look at cases like this. And they see, and they automatically say, well, it's a sexually motivated crime. Well, no, not necessarily. Okay? Sex might have been the preamble, but sex is a preamble to 90% of homicides. Well, maybe not that high, but pretty close. Okay, there's an element of sex mixed in in almost everything. But let's not mistake sexual sexual fantasy, sexual motivation for a rage killing, you know, or an anger retaliatory type of murder. This is a rage killing. Then he goes home and he watches porn. Again, it's, it's there's sexual connotation in there, right? He had to fulfill that. He had to get rid of that. Um, and he did. Now, I'm very, 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 very shocked that he said that. Very shocked. It almost makes me believe that they had some sort of evidence that he did that. Like... Uh, if he was staying at a hotel, you know, how they have records of you watching, you have to buy, the, I don't know from experience, don't try to trick me up here, but when you buy that late night, you know, type of <laughs> movie, that they charge you for it. Now, I don't know if he lived there or not. Uh, yeah, they could have had his records from... His computer, whatever it is, because that, I don't know, that, that's an odd statement to make, that he would admit that he went home and watched porn when he doesn't have to admit that. Now, I'm sure they asked that question, you know, any good investigator is going to ask, well, what, what did you do afterwards? Uh, that, that's something that I asked Bill Nagara, and I'll be talking to Bill later on today, but when I first started talking to him, it's been over a year now, you know, he had killed his wife's, his girlfriend's mom. Yes, I want to know about the act, okay? But it's just like a polygraph. I'm more interested in what happened pre-offense and then post-offense more than the actual polygraph or the killing because you can learn from that. What was your immediate thought after you killed the person? Was it, oh my goodness, what did I do? I have to get out of here. Oh my Lord, uh, what? I have to get rid of these clothes. I got to clean up the scene. I left the scene and then I cleared my head and went back to the scene. 
Those things are so important. It's just like working the case backwards from trial that I always talk about. And those are the things that I want to know. And I've always wanted to know. So, like, I questioned Bill about it because Bill says, you know, he, he blacked out. And I used to think that that was a cop-out all the time when these killers would say, oh, I, I don't remember. I blacked out. Now, Bill, who seems to be a pretty honest person to me, says that that's what happened to him. He saw so much rage and he blacked out. Well, still not 100% sure I believe that. I tend to lead on the side that he's telling me the truth. But okay. Well, now I want to know what did you think then? You know, after it was over, what was your thought process? What were you trying to do? So they asked Jordan Vandersloot this, I'm for sure. And they had to have evidence, I'm thinking, to back up that he went home and watched porn. Because I don't think he would readily admit that. But I don't know him, so it's hard to say what he would say. So I just wanted to get out those thoughts as, again, you know, as my, uh, my channel grows, the more emails and things that I'm getting asking me to do certain cases. And, you know, I try, but you have to understand that in order to do like a full assessment of a case, I can't do it in an hour. You know, it takes time to do a full good criminal assessment of the case. So I get requests almost like I'm a DJ. You know, hey, can you look at this case? Hey, can you look at this case? And I can't do it on the whim. If I do say yes, well, it takes, it, as an investigation, it t should take months. But for this purpose on the channel, it at least takes days to weeks. And I just can't get to all of them. Um, because I think it's important to, when you do a criminal assessment and you're putting it out to the masses, it needs to be fairly accurate. You need, and you can't just spout off without having X, Y, and Z in place. You know, you, it's just like a criminal profile. You can't say, well, it's a white male between 25 and 30 because you've heard that your whole life watching television. No. No, if you're going to make that claim, well, you're going to tell me why. Is it because of the demographic there? Is it because statistics show it? You, you need to come with more. That's what I would tell you guys. If you ever see somebody claim to be a criminal profiler, and there's a lot out there, and they make an assertion like that, or they say, well, they're from the area, and they don't back it up, turn the channel. Don't ever listen to them anymore. Because they don't know what they're talking. They're trying to fool you. They're a snake oil salesman. All right. And there's a lot of them out there. If you're going to say that, you have to back that up with some sort of fact or statistic. Or you're no good. I mean, anybody can get on here and just make things up. Uh, yeah, so I think she's 25 to 30, the offender from the area, probably lived about a block away, um, drove a, a big sports car um, because I see that he's masculine and look at it, break it down, see if they back up what they're saying with facts or statistics to show. That's my opinion to you. But I try to get to all of your assessments, um, but it's just not possible. And I'm just being honest with you. So the ones that I do, I take my time. Um, and to be honest, I should take more time on the cases. But then I start going down the road of being an investigator for the case when I'm not. All I'm doing is trying to present it the best that I can in a, in a nutshell so the word gets out there to the you know, million people that watch this show. You know, that's the goal. I got the platform, so I want to use it. 
that's, you know, that's what it's about. Uh, so, that's it for Natalie Holloway. I learned something from it. And I hope you guys learned something from it too. Um, and that's what you should do for every cold case. That's solved. Try to learn from that offender. You know, if you got to go back and research that offender a little bit to find out, you know, did he move from town to town, um, change his appearance, get married, stay single? Did he remain a heavy drinker or did that change? A heavy smoker, did that change? All of those things you want to learn from pre-offense to offense and post-offense behavior. Very important because then you can apply that to other cases. They're not going to be identical, but it helps to know. And then in your mind, you can say, oh, this sounded familiar. This guy did this. Oh, this guy did the same thing. At least that's the way it has helped me. So thanks for tuning in for this little quick 25-minute synopsis of Natalie Holloway case. Um, I'm glad the family got the closure that they needed, resolution that they needed. Um, it's been a long time coming. And there's so many cases like this out there that people don't even know about. So my job is try to find those cases and expose them to the public here so people know about them. It's like the Robin Pope case that I just did on Exit Unsolved. Um, go back and check that out. So, till next time, hey, thanks for watching. Mains out.